give it up for our panel. I'm super, super thrilled and proud of every single one of you on here. So thank you so much for being here today. And uh, we'll get this kicked off with the CPA of sales. So you say, what's the CPA of sales? Well, Dave, you want to chime in on, on uh, how you had to point the sales team when we first met and what, what CPA meant for us? I mean, the, the basics of, well, the premise of energy for sales is that if you're not having fun in sales, then you're doing something wrong. And it's not, it's not whimsical. It's not silly. Uh, we created daft, um, sales daftness. And you have to have, you have to have principles. You have to have a foundation. And when you boil it down, consistency, proactivity, and accountability are, are those key pillars that allow you to build a foundation, build a team, build a sales organization that can have fun in the sales process. And when you say DAF, we had discovery, activity, follow-up, and targeting. In fact, the playbook you receive after the summit is going to have the sales systems and process. And I know there's several pillars and, and sales processes out there, systems, but our DAF process was so fundamentally changing for our sales team. But what fueled those pillars, right? What fueled the, the playbook? How many of times do we have a playbook and it gets shoved in a drawer? We have a vision we wrote out or we sat down for a quarterly planning session and those goals got put aside. So the gasoline for the pillars, the gasoline for our sales system was CPA, consistency, proactivity, and accountability. And I love what um, Tony Robbins says. Uh, he says, you know, it's not what we do once in a while that changes our lives. It's what we do on a consistent basis. And I'll tell you guys, I'm not perfect at stuff. I mess a lot of stuff up, but I will tell you, I won't stop. I'll keep doing it consistently. It'll be on the calendar and it'll get done, right? And so anyway, we're going to talk about consistency today. Then we're talking about proactivity. And proactivity, I love what Alex Goldfan says. He says, you cannot react your way to sales growth. And so many times we start out proactive when we have that slump, we slide into reactivity. We start with our email, we're just reacting. And so proactivity we're going to talk about. And then accountability. Bob Proctor says accountability is the glue that ties commitment to results. So when we're sitting at the round table every quarter and we commit to something, well, how are we going to leave there and every day keep it at the forefront of our minds? So everybody on this call today is going to go around the room. We're going to share. We've got Craig, then Ryan, and Whitney sharing something along the lines of consistency for a couple minutes each. And then we're going to have Janelle, Todd, and Carnell share their thoughts on proactivity. And then Justin, Jason, and Tiswana share some practical examples and their thoughts on accountability. So team Craig, take it away. Awesome. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Yes, sir. Sweet. Awesome. Well, hey, um, I love uh, what I heard when I got the uh, tap to talk about consistency i was like oh my gosh man consistency that's a boring topic but that's okay because boring's okay in business sometimes and what i mean by that there's an old saying um or a, a, a quote from i believe it was Ra ralph waldo emerson and it's the foolish inconsistency of man is the hobgoblin of small minds so i'm not going all dead poet society on this this morning but <laughs> That definition is really the definition of insanity. It's when we do the wrong things consistently over time when we keep doing those things. And so I think whether it's in business or sales, there's really, when I'm thinking back around my career and people I work with, there's really four things that I want to get consistent on that will lead to predictable revenue growth over time. And so if you put these four things down, um, the first thing is, is if we consistently hire the right sales reps, regardless of role, whether that's SDR, outside sales, BDA, one of the 500 different titles we have for different sales roles today. But if we get really clear as an organization about the right types of people, so in sales, we have our ideal client profile. I encourage folks to identify or develop an ideal uh, candidate profile for each sales role. So step one, we do that consistently, fanatically, each and every time without fail. That's step one. Step two is once we get these great salespeople that are the right fit for our unique organizations, then we onboard and we train those people with the same consistent training and onboarding. And it's really key. Um, the first year in any role is critical. But the first year for a sales rep is um, monumental. 
and 30, 60, 90 days. We've got to be uh, fanatical about training or onboarding these people the right way. The third piece to the puzzle is that we're consistent with our coaching. Um, you can get the best people on your team. You can have the best training, the best onboarding, but if, as leaders, we're not coaching our people consistently the right way. Yeah. We're not going to have consistent results. And then when I think about consistency, uh, the last piece is we've got to consistently provide our sales reps. However, we do that the same types of quality of leads consistently. And so if you think about those four things and you do those and if you're fanatical about it, um, you will outperform your competition over the long run. And so that formula, what I love about that formula, one, it's simple, not easy to do, but it's a simple process. But at any time we're not getting consistent results, we can go back to those four buckets and determine, hey, where are we falling short? Do we need to change these things over time? And those are the things where I just really, um, if we boil things back down to the basics and we get those four things right, it's going to lead to consistent long-term results over time. Craig, that's strong. Thank you. It's interesting. I'm watching the panel and they're, they're each writing things down, which that's the beauty of this. That's what's the beauty of the podcast. The reason these folks are on this whole movement is about from the trenches to the trenches. These aren't people that have written books and haven't sold anything. They're, they're in the trenches every day. So, Craig, thank you. That's awesome. Absolutely. It's fantastic. Boring, boring is good, right? So, Ryan, you're next, brother. Awesome. Hey, so excited to be here on a Saturday morning. Um, this is just uh, really, really exciting. So um, when it came to consistency, um, when, when Tim first said it to me, I said, oh, man, I don't know if that's the best topic for me to speak on. But um, then as I started just looking back on my last 16 years here at Champion and kind of looking at the, the essence of a lot of these relationships that we have now that bring in you know, a lot of business and a lot of revenue, I tried to just hone in on kind of where, where did this start and kind of what, what helped feed this. So um, so my consistency is related to building long lasting and deep relationships with customers. And, um, number one, it starts, I think with developing some type of time blocking and guarding against all interruptions. Um, our business, like probably many businesses, you're always getting interrupted by things that appear to be urgent, but, um, you kind of have to have this sacred time specifically dedicated to customer lead generation, obviously follow up. And then another type of time blocking that I started doing more recently, which is helpful is just time blocking to creatively think. Um, so it's kind of a blank slate, like, and, and really my focus there is like, I'm thinking about my customers um, and I'm thinking about, you know, who specifically I should be following up with and how I can make that, that follow up or, or somebody I'm going after really effective. Now, as we're talking about, you know, just reaching out to potential customers or past customers, I think the consistency of the outreach is really important. Um, but the, but diversifying the types of touches is important. I think um, providing something informational on a regular basis, any industry updates is sort of the base layer to everything that, that'll put you, you know, that's what the competition should be doing anyways, but you kind of have to do that as well. You got to be the resource for, for new things going on in your industry. Then the next layer I think of is sort of like your value add touch points. Um, you know, can I, can I provide them with a uh, vendor introduction that would be helpful? Can I make an introduction to a referral source for this, this person? Uh, what are their hiring needs? You know, um, can I make an intro with a friend or family that can help meet those needs? So now you layer that on top of, of your, your being an educational resource. You're already one leg up on a lot of the competition if you can do any of that. Then I think the most effective is your personal connection touches, right? Your, um, this might be your handwritten notes. This might be your videos. This might be being able to stop by and have coffee. This might be lunch. And a lot of times that comes later in the relationship, but um, you know, that's where, that's where you're really building the value and differentiating yourself. And, you know, this has really served me well um, over the years. I've had people that have said no up front um, for many years even, but I'm just kind of there in the background as maybe their second option or their third option. And then things happen over the years. And, and some of our largest account, I can think of, you know, a, a lender um, that just called me out of the blue 
And I was not the title company that they were working with um, for years. But then they said, hey, we're going to do a corporate partnership. We want to work with you guys. We don't, we're not even going to interview anybody else. You know, so that type of a thing. And then you're doing hundreds of transactions a month from something just being consistent on this stuff. Now, one thing is the frequency of outreach to me is always a little bit of, um, I think it kind of varies depending on the person and the opportunity. Um, you don't want to make that an excuse to say, oh, I think I'm going to like spam them and I shouldn't outreach too much. But for me, this is where you know, I'm a man of faith. I really rely on God for wisdom and creativity in my outreach. So I try to pray, pray before the day, um, ask the Lord to open the doors and, and close the ones I'm not supposed to go into. But just really, I look at myself like I'm planting seeds, I'm watering them. Um, God does the growing. And he's going to tell me when I need to harvest them and maybe, you know, go a little stronger on the sales ask. And I think this is something that Tim Hooper is really good at, uh, having, having worked in the industry with him. And he knows exactly where to push and pull in terms of asking for that business. But um, if you do it this way, I think you're going to get some early wins, which is great. But I think you plan for the long haul and you'll find that, you know, over time, you're going to get some, some great new accounts just by doing those things consistently. I love it, Ryan. I, I, you know, it's the tortoise tough mentality, right? It's the hare or the tortoise, and I'd rather play the long game. And uh, when you're there, when you're consistent and you keep showing up, they know who to call. Um, so that's great. Hey, somebody, um, it, one of our panelists was kind enough to share. Um, it, it, all of anyone participating, if you have a question, uh, just make sure when you put it in the chat box that you change the setting to everyone. That way, everyone in the, uh, in the audience has the benefit of seeing your question and, and chiming in and adding some value that way. So just change that to everyone. Justin, that cover it. Cool. Perfect. Perfect. All right. Well, we'll, we'll roll on here. Let's see. I've lost my, uh, my note here in the comment, but uh, let's see who's next here. Uh, Whitney. Yeah. So it's all you. It's all me. Great. Um, so when it comes to consistency, you know, I played sports for most of my life, right? Um, <clears throat> and so growing up, my dad always told me, you know, practice, practice makes perfect. That's not necessarily the case because if you're not practicing perfect, how can you expect perfection, right? So he was teaching me always to be consistent in everything that I do to hone in on those skills that I have, right? So being a leader, coming in here, and being able to, I love coaching new hires. I love having new people come on my team. But one thing I've learned as a leader that we have to do and we have to get better at, and this kind of goes back to what Craig said, is that hiring and onboarding and the coaching, you have to set firm expe expectations with your reps, right? You have to be able to have those conversations and say, hey, this, these are my expectations of you. Now, the organization factor that comes into that, yes, it's going to depend on every rep. Every rep is going to have a different path. But the thing is, is those paths are consistent. You're doing the same thing every day that's going to generate the revenue. And I think that's why it's very important from leaders when we're trying to teach, hey, you know, go make 25 phone calls or, or go talk on the phone for four hours. You know, you can't just say that. you got to give the why behind it. Because if you give the why behind it, you're going to have consistent performance right and and that consistency they're gonna when they see the rewards you're gonna have <coughs> that are working harder you're gonna have more dedication not just to you know them selling but then their investment into the company um culture will get better we'll talk on that later um so that right there is going to bring a successful environment to you so i think it's very important that from a leadership perspective that you know we're explaining the why to be able to drive that consistency, mm. right? Or else you're going to have reps that are like, hey, you know, you're, you're constantly telling me to do these things and they're not paying off, right? And then that's when, you know, we go back to Craig's, you know, four points. Number four, you got to, you know, consistently coach them and consistently help and, you know, gain their trust there um, and be able to provide better leads and provide feedback to that, those reps. So wow. um, I know at first – David told me I was going to be doing like accountability, accountability, which that was going to be great, but consistency, you know, you can't have a winning atmosphere or a winning team unless you're consistently driving for the same results at the same time and walking the same line. So that's Whitney, about, yeah. Whitney, that's great. And one, one thing I wanted to mention, because we have a lot of sales leaders on and, and consistency, we need to be consistent as sales leaders. We are all under a lot of pressure every day from many different directions mm -hmm. and there are times that that forces us to be a little bit inconsistent in maybe our tone or approach so 
let's as leaders let's also bring that internally um because our consi- our systems and processes will allow us to be consistent in our day but with everything thrown at us we have to have a consistency in in our approach and our working with our teams that's tricky at times yeah i love it Thanks. Wendy, great great job i love the quote that says um uh, you know, if you want your team to, to build a ship, don't give them a stack of lumber, take them to the ocean. And I think every day, taking them back to that why, keeping that why in front of them, showing them the majesty of the ocean and what, what's possible. Um, I think consistently keeping that why elevated is huge. So that rolls us into proactivity and Janelle's going to kick us off on being proactive. All right. So it's interesting. So when I first sat down and I started making some notes about how I increase proactivity and inspire my team to be proactive. I kept coming up with things that were more focused on what I'm doing and not what my team's doing. And I would scratch it off and go, all right, next category. Like, no, that's also something I do. So then it dawned on me that if I want to increase proactivity and inspire proactivity in my team, I have to lead by example. And Whitney actually teed me up perfectly and we didn't plan it. So to me, because to get my team to be proactive, they need to know what results they're trying to achieve. I need to set firm expectations with them. They need to understand their why. Because to me, to act proactively is to act with intention. And if you don't know what your intention is, you're not going to get to your end results. Mm-hmm. You know, I think about when someone says, you know, jump and you're like, how high? You know, I used to think it was just blind agreement. Now, from the sales leader perspective, I understand that they're actually asking, well, what's my target? So the same thing. When I tell my team, I need you to sign more accounts, I need you to increase revenue, they're asking how much and how many. So I think one way that I inspire my team to be proactive is to be completely transparent with our team goals and their individual goals. And then we'll also sit down and game plan how they're going to get to those goals. I think when I was initially trying to answer this question, I viewed proactivity and my guidance of them as like mutually exclusive. And now I understand that they really go together. So to build a roadmap and strategies as to how we're going to get to our goals, it's what's going to make them proactive. And also I thought about you know, anticipating any problems or obstacles that come along the way. And I think the way to inspire proactivity as a leader is you know, by me asking leading questions. So for example, you know, if I want my team to do prospecting calls every week on Monday morning, I might ask, you know, do you set up to prospect this week? Is there anything that's going to get in your way to get them thinking about, all right, well, I'm on the road on Tuesday and Thursday, and it's my kid's birthday on Friday. How am I going to get around this? And how am I still going to get my results done? I think one example of the proactivity on my team and how I lead by example is that we're constantly reviewing their current accounts. Every week we have a one-on-one meeting, which I know will tie into our sessions later. And we're going through and I'm asking them questions to review what's going on here and making them think. So it gets them to me that ties in with the consistency as well, because it gets them thinking and anticipating, like, I know what she's going to ask, I'm going to do it before she asks. And then my final comment, because I would love it if everybody, the desire to meet your goals was enough, but I think I'd be remiss if I didn't say that you inspire proactivity with incentives and talk about the money. So I think contests, money, and transparent goals would be my answer. I love that. Pay, pay for A, right? Pay for A players. <laughs> and I love that you said, um, uh, ask leading, quite, help, you know, helping them to be realistic proactively, you know, what's in your week, what's, what are the roadblocks? In fact, it's uh, Justin, Todd, and I are going to talk about removing the springs, one of the sessions and so many things about getting ahead of some of those obstacles and helping our team. So being proactive as a leader, I love that you said that, right? You had to think through your proactivities and then, Hey, does my team uh, model those? Am I coaching them? So it ties into Craig's point about consistently coaching. Love it. Solid. All right, Todd, you're up next. Proactivity. Awesome. Um, mine, I was thinking more in terms of conversations with the client. Um, when it comes to setting expectations, being proactive and discussing kind of the, the process to, to kind of walk through what we do and, um, you know, setting up the conversations kind of a on the front end of saying, hey, first we're going to do this, then we're going to do this and this, so that as you're going through a a process to lead them down, you know, a sales process, 
there aren't any gotchas. There's no surprises as best you can. So, you know, Janelle, like, like being an attorney, you want to be able to foresee and answer any question that comes at you and already have the solution. So that's kind of what we're trying to set in their mind of, um, you know, proactively reframing the way they think about our value proposition, you know, pre, you know, proactively setting conversations up because in, in my world, we're having multiple different conversations around different solutions that we consolidate into one. So a lot of times it's the first time they've seen things that way. So I think it, 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 it diffuses a lot of the frustration. Um, it, it, it helps set just better expectations, I guess, is where I'm trying to go with all this. So I think being proactive and, hey, here's what we're going to do. Here's why we're going to do it. And here's why it's important. It eliminates a lot of roadblocks. It eliminates a lot of objections if you just kind of get the elephant out of the room real quick mm -hmm. on the front end. So I think it sets up a better cons consultative conversation when you explain to them, here's one. It's, it's kind of like telling a story. Here's what I'm going to tell you. You tell the story, and then here's what I just told you. I think that's kind of the, the best way to approach, um, especially a complex sale, is, is to really unpack it so they understand why you're asking for certain things. Um, I think it moves along faster. There's less friction. And then you can also, if there's, if there's different, uh, different you know, stakeholders on their team, you have a CFO, you have someone in HR, and you have someone in legal, they're, they're looking at it from different lenses. So mm -hmm. even identifying, hey, here's what you're going to, you're going to want to know about this. Here's what you're going to want to know. Then you come in as the thought leader. Hey, this guy knows his stuff. He also knows what's important to me. Um, so it, it helps their internal conversations when you're not in the room. I think flow better too because they they are they're understanding what's important to each other and it helps them unpack better questions when you're not there to you know to kind of sell if you would so that's that was my thought on the proactive piece of going into a situation we all know our processes we all know what we need and we I think a lot of times assume the client would just follow right along but um, not always the case sometimes the dumbest thing will pop up that you could have uh, proactively addressed early on. And just give it a thumbs up or down, and then you move right past, and it becomes a non-issue. So that, that's that's my thought on, on proactivity. Todd, as always, that was strong. I know your industry. I've I've loved that industry for a long time, and there are places in your industry and all of ours where being proactive in the pitfalls, um, at insperity and in, in PEOs, when legal takes a look at this and they see that oh, so we're not going to control, we're not going to own our employees anymore. That's a pitfall, and when you have so being proactive in 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 the pitfalls and the stumbling blocks, I think are important. True. Sure. Good deal. Well, Todd, uh, yes, absolutely strong. Carnell, you're up next, brother. Hey guys, morning all. Um, so before I go into the proactivity piece, I just a little inside baseball. I love when I'm smack in the middle of a panel. So I can benefit from hearing all the smart stuff the smart people before me said, but there's still enough to, to jump on, so I'm not telling. So that's great. Uh, so, guys, when you think about proactivity, and Todd said something that really stuck out, uh, you know, when you're dealing with customers, it can make you come off as a thought leader when you're thinking about problems before they happen. I, I want to kind of extend that. That doesn't just stop with customers, right? Um, from my perspective, being proactive uh, in your sales career as a sales leader um, really comes down to a couple of different things. One, are you anticipating customers' needs before they happen? Are you being proactive in your development? Are you being proactive in your team's development? Mm. Are you being proactive in your education? What you really do by kind of executing those things is you're buying credibility, right? If you can think about problems before they exist for the customer, you're buying credibility to the customer. If you're thinking about your team's career and what they're going to do one, three, five, seven years from now, you're buying credibility by being proactive about you know, the way that they, they go about their business. Um, and then with your, you know, as you think about, you know, long-term value, um, and I think Ryan mentioned this earlier, um, you know, the way that you, you know, you build long-term value is through consistent process. The way you can build consistent process is being thoughtful and proactive around how you're going about your day. And that's something that I think great salespeople do. Um, I challenge you to find a great salesperson or a great sales leader or a great fill in the blank in their field that's not proactive about how they're getting better every single day and how they're holding their team accountable. So, you know, it all really goes together um, kind of in that nutshell. And then the last thing that I'll, that I'll kind of touch on, and Whitney said the word culture earlier, being proactive with your culture um, and you know, 
this around being intentional, that is going to be the key to any long-term success for any organization. Um, setting those expectations, being transparent, understanding what you're trying to accomplish and why, and having that proactive mindset is how you build a long-lasting um, kind of legacy success. Um, the, the cool thing about all of this and even the summit is being able to learn from folks that have either learning to do it alongside of you um, or have done it before um, and have great ideas about how to do it in the future. So be proactive around your own development, um, how you build your culture, um, and as well around how you're dealing with your customers. So um, like I said, that's like why I like being stuck in the middle so I can steal things and then still build my point. So uh, that's all I got. Thanks, guys. Well, I think you've been officially dubbed Captain America. So <laughs> again, the creativity with uh, the virtual space these days. So Sherry, I love it. Uh, that's Carnell's new uh, new name. Yep. So uh, one one small thing about proactivity, <laughs> um, especially in complex um, opportunities, there's a proactivity element internally that you might need to get internal teams ahead of ahead of it. So look at proactivity and, and an opportunity. What stakeholders? Um, who do I want to bring in early instead of late, and and go together. So that was. Um, when, when all three of you were talking, I was thinking about that element, I was, and it, it's important um, yeah. to, to bring something to close quicker. It's better to have everyone together at the front end, so be proactive in that regard as well. And, and I love how you sum that up, Carnell, with when you anticipate those needs, those client needs, or what resources you're going to need, that generates credibility. That, that buys credibility. It generates high trust. Um, so, and, and it ties into what Ryan said earlier, is putting time on the calendar to actually think tank because how many of us get so busy that like Todd said, we, we make that dumb mistake. We, it could have been avoided, but it was just Tim got too busy, sped through the process, took for granted a client, knew my process, didn't. it. Um, so anticipating and generating high trust, that's huge. All right. Well, we're moving on to accountability and Justin's here to kick us off with accountability. Awesome. So I want to start with this idea that, Accountability is not something you do to someone. Um, it, you know, people are not like dogs where you give them a treat when they're good and you scold them when they're bad. It, accountability comes from, it's the result of the right combination of leadership and management. And another thing I hear a lot is, you know, I want leaders, not managers. And that drives me crazy because those are two different concepts and you need both of them. You know, leadership is when you're working on the business, you're providing clear direction, you're creating an opening for your people to head into. Management is working in the business. It's that day-to-day -day execution, the clear expectations. And you really have to have both to set yourself up for accountability. So I wanna just hit a few things on each of those. So from leadership, if you can answer these five questions with a yes, then you're providing great leadership for your people. One, are you giving them clear direction? Have you cast the vision? Have you made clear what's the end goal? Where are we headed as a company? What are we trying to achieve? Two, are you giving them the tools that they need? Whether that's the, the right uh, technology, the right support staff, the right amount of your time, right? Are you equipping them with the tools that they need to be successful? When you've given them that direction and you've set them up with the tools, are you letting go, right? Are you delegating the right things and letting go and getting out of the way? Are you acting with the greater good in mind? Are you setting the example for your people to not act selfishly, not act with their own interests, but act with the greater good of the company in mind? And then finally, and this ties back to something that's been said a couple of times, are you taking clarity breaks? Are you taking the time to step back and ask yourself, am I doing these things? Am I protecting the time to make sure that I'm clear on what I should be doing, that I'm supporting my people the right way? So if you're doing those things, you're leading. Management, five more questions. If you can answer yes to these, you're in good shape. First, are you keeping your expectations clear? Right, You've provided that direction, which is the end goal. Your expectations are how they contribute to getting there. Are you keeping those clear with your people? Are you communicating well? Not making assumptions about what they think or what they're doing, 
but you've got two-way dialogue. You're creating a safe space for you guys to talk to each other and nobody's ever assuming what's on the, the other's mind. You're talking it out. You just ask when you have that question. Do you have the right meeting pulse? Are you checking in with your people the right amount? Keeping the circles connected so that you're not stepping all over each other, but the right hand knows what the left hand's doing. So you find that pulse, whether that's weekly, a daily huddle, it looks different for everybody, but you have that right pulse. At least <clears throat> once a quarter, are you sitting down and having a conversation about how they're doing? Not a review, not a formal thing, but just sitting down and saying what's working and what's not working. And then last, are you rewarding and recognizing people when they do really well? And when they fall short, are you providing that feedback clearly? Uh, I, I love what Brene Brown says, clear is kind, unclear is unkind. When somebody's not cutting it, when they're not making their goals or they're not achieving what you need them to achieve, have that conversation honestly. Don't hold back and take the action that's necessary. So if you can answer yes to those on leadership and management, you're going to have accountability. That's what creates it. Strong. Wow. I love the, I love the uh, clarity you gave me as I was taking some notes between leadership and management. I, I love that. Um, so I, I've got a lot to chew on here, uh, Justin. And I love the questions, um, you know, that immediately makes our minds start working, right? We're asking ourselves those questions. So, wow. So very good. Um, I think that the meeting uh, pulse is probably the, one of the biggest things because how many times have, have we started something you know, we, 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 we did a meeting, uh, it, it went really well, but there was no, there was, there was no follow up to that. It didn't last. We didn't come back and do it. It, it wasn't a consistency to go back to consistency, but the check and the accountability with our team. Um, and then I love the empathy that you brought in Justin with, it's not, this is not a professional development chat. This is not a performance review. This is a, how are you doing chat once a quarter, especially right now, guys, um, you know, accountability, is, it goes both ways. It's who, who am I accountable to and who am I accountable for? David and Je Janelle and I will talk more on that. But um, right now, more than ever before, uh, there's mental health and burnout and fatigue. And um, I call them pandemic islands happening where people are getting off. By, you know, it, people are burning <clears throat> out sometimes because they work harder at home because um, they don't know how to turn it off. They don't have that, that natural line. So as leaders and managers, Justin, I love that you said that. Sit down. How are you doing? What's working? What's not working? So great job. Wow. Um, Jason, you're up next, Captain, my captain. Thanks, Tim. I uh, appreciate you having me. I, uh, to Carnell's point, it's tough being going towards the end, but I've really, I've, I've got chicken scratch all over my notes here because everyone said great <laughs> things that I've tried to add in. So it's said I'm better than me as usual. But to me, I'm going to pick up on sort of a theme that, that Justin uh, said early on in his, his points about the greater good. To me, accountability means teamwork. Um, and I think it's very tough because we know what consistency means for the most part. We know what proactive, being proactive means we know we have to do that, but how to be accountable is tough. And then, then this is another area to take us out of our comfort zone, right? So we, we have these tough calls on sales and we've got these doors we don't maybe want to knock on. And we, and we don't like no's and we get all over that, but how do we be accountable? Because that is being a good team teammate and really the, the long, the long term. It's another safe zone we have to come out of. So um, similar to what Whitney said early on, I use sports analogies. So um, I'm going to uh, use a little analogy here in a minute, but I want to share our sort of our company's theme for the last year. Um, and it came, we were, we were searching for a theme and someone actually, as with all good quotes, heard this and we didn't create it, but uh, we adopted it. And that quote is, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Yeah. And sort of a dumb version for guys like me is there's no I in team. Um, so we really adopted that and that's been successful for us. And um, Tim and David asked me to, to talk about accountability a couple of weeks ago. And I was able to uh, see this play out with one of my son's teams. And I'll give you that sports example. I'm, I live in Louisville, Kentucky, and I'm sitting two hours west in Evansville, Indiana right now waiting for another soccer game to, to start here in a couple hours. But, you know, this team was having some troubles. And uh, this is my son, oldest son's team. And they were pointing a lot of fingers at each other. And they were saying, well, you got scored on or you didn't do this, you didn't do that. And the coach said, look, we've got to be accountable to each other. 
And we can't, it's the individual that focuses on the goal that's scored. It's the teammate that recognizes well, that goal might have come from a breakdown in the midfield and et cetera, et cetera. But it's the leader that sees the opportunity to work on all of the above and practice and make the team better. So, um, you know, sort of bringing that back into our work lives, uh, we are only as strong as our weakest link. Uh, we're only as, as strong. So what does that mean for each of us? Are we, are we uh, in charge of the accounting department? No, we've got to figure out, we're servant leaders. We've got to figure out ways to work so that when we're out there making the sale, there are no hiccups. Um, so again, when I come back to it, again, to the, to the, to the sports analogy, we want to go, we, we don't want to go fast, but we want to go far. Jason, that was great. Uh, and I love the fact that you brought up teammate. Tim and I had a, uh, a fun time on the podcast. Uh, the difference between teammate and team member. Yeah, I'm a team member. Well, it's kind of like passive, you know, being a teammate, being accountable to each other, lifting someone up, understanding the greater good. You want to be a mate, not a team member. So I would challenge each of us to go back and listen to that podcast. But simply, am I a team member? Am I a member on a team or am I a teammate? Because we got to lift everyone up. Strong. Um, I was helping a buddy, I was coaching him on his book, uh, another sales leader in the New York Life Channels one time. And uh, his, his title was, I'm not good unless you are. I'm not good unless you are. And it was, I mean, he was an empathetic person. I think some of us have empathy more than others, but um, I'm not good unless you are. And his whole concept was, I am accountable for my team. Uh, so I love that. There's no I in team. Jason, great analogy, uh, as always. And uh, Jason actually took a video not too long ago walking through their office, uh, and, and they, had the, they had the bullpen going. They had, a, and we call it the bullpen, uh, we all get on the phone together and make those calls that, you know, some of our people and, and some of y'all listening, you know, maybe your folks are, uh, they have some call reluctance, you know, do it together. Um, if there's something that you can't overcome or do it together, um, and we'll talk more about some of those strategies in our third session today. But uh, without further ado, we've got uh, Tiswana coming to round us out here on accountability. I got to coach Tiswana's team and what a joy it was. And I just thought with the, with the radiance of her team and the accountability and the consistency of their calls, I thought she had to come on here. But Tiswana, if you don't mind, uh, before you wrap us up on accountability, uh, would you just share a little bit about American cancer? Because I want you to be able to have uh, that opportunity here um, uh, today. Sure. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, as you said, I'm with the American Cancer Society. Society, and we do sell hope and not widgets, what I call, you know, generic products and services. And so I do think the principles of accountability are the same, however. But um, before I get into that, the American Cancer Society, we help people become knowledgeable partners in their own care. Um, if you can imagine receiving a cancer diagnosis is one of the scariest times in your life. And we do this through advocacy, closing loopholes and laws that cause extra funds or not being able to put out certain drugs or have enough money for research. We also do this through patient support and services. We provide free lodging for people when, they, when their best chance for effective treatment is far from home through a network of more than 30 Hope Lodges across the country. Uh, we also provide free transportation to and from uh, cancer treatment uh, to me, that one seems pretty simple, but can you imagine going through chemo and not having a ride and trying to drive yourself to and from chemo because your loved ones are working to help pay for those bills? So we do provide that service. Um, we provide some peer-to-peer -peer support services and, and much more. And then also, we're probably best known for our work in discovery which is research. We are the largest funder of research outside of the federal government. Um, we funded now 40, 49 Nobel laureates. Um, and really we've been a part of every major breakthrough um, in cancer research since 1946. So I just use one quick example. It's kind of a duh and moment now that you know smoking leads to lung cancer and other things. It was the American Cancer Society who did a study in the 1950s who really linked those things. Uh, we funded the doctor who developed tamoxifen, who discovered the BRCA1 gene, and I could go on and on. But 
If you're interested in learning about the American Cancer Society, you can go to cancer.org. There's a wealth of information. We're also open 24 hours a day, seven days a week with our 1-800 number, which can also be found on cancer.org, where you'll actually get a live person and cancer specialist to talk you through your journey. So I tried to make that as quick as possible. I know that's not what we're here for today. Um, but again, in, in, in terms of accountability, I was really thinking about it from the customer standpoint, which again, for us is that donor or volunteer and kind of looking at four things. Uh, one, it starts with you, meaning all of us. Um, two, follow up and follow through. Uh, three, make it more than a sale. And four, what I think is most important to really aim to delight. So in terms of, you know, it's starting with you, uh, accountability is not something that can be delegated. Whether you're an individual contributor or you're the leader of the team, we are all responsible and accountable to each other, as many of you have already said, and then, of course, to that customer, donor, or constituent. Um, mistakes do happen, and I think the most important thing is to own it to let the client know that the mistake has happened and what you're going to do to fix it, fix it immediately, and then ultimately deliver. I think follow up and follow through um, is something that's really important throughout the process, whether things are going well or they're not going well, you really need to stay in touch with that client, donor, or constituent to let them know how things are going, provide updates, and to me, ask for feedback along the way. Uh, in the fundraising world, we say, if you ask for money, you're gonna get advice. If you ask for advice, you're gonna get money. You know, really asking people for feedback helps them engage in your product or services. People love to share, you know, their expertise. Now, you have to then go back and do something with that information. You need to make sure that that client felt heard. Um, so you need to implement something that either makes sense to your business model or something that makes sense for that particular transaction and kind of keep in touch with them to let them know that you heard them, you're gonna follow up. Um, in terms of more than a sale, you know, for us in fundraising, it's all about relationships, which I'm sure is the same, you know, in any other business. You really want to get to know your donor or client. It's only going to endear you to them, you know, a little bit more, and you're going to be feel like more responsible, like I really have to make sure I deliver on this because now I really know Tim and I don't want, you know, to let him down. And then they're going to feel, you know, a little bit more endeared to you and start to really build a partnership and accountability because now they're feeling like, hmm, the SWAN or the American Cancer Society is delivering for me. Let me make sure I do the same for them. Um, and I think the last thing in terms of, you know, really needing to aim to delight, to me is the most important thing. The other three things I say is basic, right? You're going to, you're going to take ownership, you're going to follow up and follow through, and you're going to get to know your, your folks, right? But who wants basic service these days? Everyone wants to feel special. So the best example I can give for uh, aim to delight is really a restaurant situation. I love to go out to eat. Sometimes you go to a restaurant, you're greeted. Uh, you sit down, you, the waiter takes your order, you get your food, it tastes okay, you pay, you go. Okay, are you going to write home about that? Probably not, you're full, you, you went and, you know, you had an experience, I suppose. Now, think of a time when you've walked into a restaurant and the hostess, you know, greets you so warmly, you feel like an old friend. You're like, oh, have I been here before? Does this person know me? Then you sit down and the waiter is super attentive. They're really listening to what you like so that they can make informed suggestions based on your taste for what you might like on the menu. Um, and because you had so many questions, they might sneak you a little taste of something that you didn't order just so you can see. Then either the manager, the chef, or the owner comes over, right? And they ask you, how, how are things going? Do you have everything you need? And they ask you for that feedback and then greet you once again. You know, uh, the food comes out, it's absolutely perfect. The dessert is great. And because you've built this great rapport with the waiter, they, they comp you, uh, you know, a nice dessert drink to go with your dessert. And then when you ask for, you know, a doggy bag, that hot, delicious bread they've been serving you with th your dinner, they put a fresh basket of that, you know, to go in your doggy bag. And, and you're leaving feeling like, wow, you know, I'm feeling really special here. And so I think what happens there is every single person in that restaurant feels accountable to making sure that their diner has a great experience. And then what happens is you leave feeling special, 
you're more prone to tell a friend or family member about your fabulous experience. So now that restaurant has another salesperson, right? So it's not just all those people who are working on sales. It's now the patrons who are going out and really being ambassadors for that restaurant. And of course, are going to be repeat customers. So if you take nothing else from this, I would say, you know, aim to delight in whatever you're doing, because you're going to have a repeat customer, you're then going to have an ambassador. And that's a really great way uh, to, to grow your sales. I, I absolutely love it. And uh, I think the second mile mentality that aiming to delight, I think that comes when we accept our responsibility for the greater good, what Carnell was saying is, you know, listen, this is not just a job. This is not just a career. It's a calling. I get to change lives. I get to set people on trajectories to succeed and my team, my clients. So when we start thinking that extra mile and aiming to delight, Swan, I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that. Ah, uh, my goodness. Absolutely. Carnell. Yes, she did. Strong close. So we've got four minutes till break. I did want to share really quickly, um, you all received the handout and I put the link in the comments earlier. Sam, if it's okay, I was just going to share uh, my screen. Am I able to do that? It's, okay, there we go. All right. So I'm going to share my screen just real quick and run us through the handout. Can you guys see my screen? Okay. So we've got session notes and resources in this handout. And then, like I said, after the summit, you guys will be receiving a sales playbook, which is really a structure. It's a tool for you in developing your own systems and processes. And it's just some things to think through. And it's, it's, very, it's very challenging. When I read through it myself, I'm like, ooh, that's something I've, I've lost track of or, or, or I haven't been keeping up with the team. So it, a sales playbook is something to go back to and, and look at the fundamentals, right? Back to the basics. So, but today, session notes and resources. And I do want to show you, just take you to the, um, to the last page because that's where the donation link is. Please read over our why, why we're here in the welcome uh, and then get involved. Uh, you can also click on that link for the American Cancer Society there on page two. Uh, and then uh, please uh, meet all of our sales leaders today by connecting with them on LinkedIn. Um, so many of these uh, talented folks uh, can be a resource to your company. Uh, so think of them as an advisor that you may need uh, down the road. And so please connect with them on LinkedIn and thank them for coming. Um, and then obviously the agenda, we've got the session notes, we've got three power pack sessions coming up. And then last but not least, um, a couple of things I want to point out. Um, you can just take your phone out and, and, and hold your camera up to each one of these barcodes and it'll take you right to the different screens. But please follow the podcast. We drop a podcast every week with a sales leader or a powerful topic. Uh, join our sales group on Facebook. It's a private group, but sales mindset. Follow our page over on LinkedIn. There's the American Cancer Society donate link. Um, if your company donated and you're here because of that, thank you so much to, the co to your company for their donation. I know several donated in big ways, um, but that does not mean we can't donate individually. In fact, what's so cool is when you donate, um, you can actually do it in somebody's honor and they will send out a card. I'll tell you a very touching moment is when I received a card from one of our title agents uh, or my wife received the card, but I received it in the mail I thought, what's American Cancer sending me? And it was from one of our title agents who did their donation um, on behalf of my wife, Jennifer. And so I just thought that was super cool. So please feel free. We recommended a $49 uh, donation uh, for attendance. So please feel free to do that. And then uh, if you don't mind, jump on and leave us a Google review. Um, you're going to get value out of today. And obviously reviews help, helps energy for sales and, and our, um, our platform stand out. So thank you all for that. And that's the handout I'll stop sharing. And we'll roll into break. David, any closing remarks from this powerful session? No, I think this was fantastic. Um, I've taken notes. That's why we do this. That's why we do this every week. Um, it's, it's about our, our friends that can share and help um, sales, professional sales leaders uh, sharpen their saw and, and have more fun in sales. Absolutely. All right, well, time to get a refill on the coffee, and uh, we're coming back for creating a winning culture with uh, Carnell, Whitney, and David. So uh, get your pens out, get your notepads, and uh, get the coffee refreshed. Uh, Sam will take us to break.
Absolutely. Guys, we'll be back at 9.35. And real quick, I'd be remiss. There were just a couple things that super stuck out to me. And one, I love that Brene Brown quote, clear is kind, unclear is unkind. Setting expectations prevents literally, what would you guys say, like 90% of problems, whether it's with clients and customers or your team, expectations are huge. And, and uh, to Swana, I, after, I was jotting down midway feedback, midway feedback. People are used to getting asked what the process was like when the process is over. If you ask them what the process is like during the process, that is a totally new experience to them. And you are going to get nothing um, but great results from that tactic. So we will see you guys at 935. Uh, we'll see you in a few minutes. Thanks. Eastern time. Thanks, Sam. Yeah, that was <laughs> <laughs>